my sermon today, guys, is um, your brother and companion in tribulation. Your brother and companion in tribulation. And it's, it's primarily about church. But I, I chose that title, your brother and companion in tribulation, because although we're not really feeling it as hard as other Christians in the world, um, and we are getting, you know, minor tribulation, I would say, um, there, there will come times uh, where that could be intensified. And I think church is important because if you look around, everyone here, our brothers and sisters, will be our companion in tribulation. Okay. Uh, so like I said, it's, it's, uh, the, today's sermon is focused on church. Um, and it, it's looking uh, at the... So in the next two chapters of Revelation, uh, they're letters to the seven churches in Asia, right? Um, and these letters are messages from Jesus Christ himself. Um, so what we're going to do is look through them. Um, so we're going to look through the letters of the church, seven churches in Asia. Um, to learn about the importance of church in our lives as children of God. All right, to begin with, uh, I'm going to uh, look at, uh, define what church is by going to the passages in the Bible. Um, so if, uh, actually, I won't get you guys to turn there, but I think if you recall from Tuesday, Pastor Kevin touched on this. Um, so in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12, if you can turn there quickly, you can, but I'll just go through it really quickly. It says, I will, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church. Will I sing praise unto thee? In the midst of the church, will I sing praise unto thee? I will declare unto my brethren. Now, the parallel passage is back in Psalm 22, verse 22. Remember, Pastor Kevin went to that to show us that. It says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise thee. All right, so what church is basically, it's a group of believers, a congregation of believers, um, brethren in Christ and children of God. This is what church is. And I, and I also want to go back to the first time um, I think church is, is mentioned in the Bible, I think. Uh, it actually uses the term congregation, but I just want to show you, because from the very beginning, what church was always about, what it was always about. So if you all want to turn to me to Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. So the word church, it just simply means congregation or a group. More specifically, a group of believers, those that have believed upon the Lord and called upon his name. So we're going to Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. Right, word of God reads, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you, Speak ye unto the congregation, there's that word congregation, of Israel, saying in the tenth day of this month they shall take them, in the, sorry, in the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb. Keep that word in mind, lamb. Who is the lamb of God? Reading on. According to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. Jump down to verse 5 if you can, please, guys. I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit there. Verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish, without blemish, nothing wrong with it, without sin. That sort of reminds you of someone, doesn't it? Jumping down to verse 6, if you will, please. Verse 6, and ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, and they shall take of the blood, the blood, and strike it on the two side posts and the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire, fire, hell, and the unleavened bread. And with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Down to verse 11, if you will, please. Just looking down there to verse 11, same chapter. And thus you shall eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. We remember Jesus Christ was crucified on Passover. He fulfilled that feast of Passover. You have a look there. Roast with fire. Remember we went to hell for three days and three nights for our sins. You shall take of the blood. They had, to, they had to put the blood on the doorposts. And the interesting thing about it was when um, the death angel came into Egypt, all the, all the doorposts that had the blood on it, he passed over. They didn't die. Sort of represents our heart when we believe in our heart, confess with our mouth. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin and, and, and unrighteousness. Amen. All right. So if you see there, guys, the very, well, that's the very first mention of the word congregation. 
which like I showed you is, is, is a synonym for the word church. So church has always been about Jesus, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world and the gathering together of those that have believed on him unto salvation. And you notice in history, always in history, things have changed for the better through the church. Things have changed for the better through the church when they're preaching the word of God with boldness, the word of God. All right, so again, this sermon, we're going to look at the letters um, to the seven churches in Asia because they're pretty much the last messages that our Lord and Saviour gave to us, didn't he, in the Bible before he went to go be with the Father in heaven. All right, so if you want to look back at Revelation chapter 1 there, we're going to start at verse 12. Verse 12. Revelation chapter 1, verse 12. So I'm going to show you... Um, Because in all the letters, there's a bit of an introduction of who's giving the message. Okay? And you can compare it yourself when you get the time. But you know the letters are in chapter 2 and chapter 3. But in this uh, reading from verse 12 here, it shows who is the one. And they're describing the character and the characteristics of the one that is giving the, the message to the churches. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks... All right. That reference is used in Ephesus to describe the one. All right. One like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. So there's someone walking in the midst of the seven candlesticks, which you read in verse 20 there. It's the churches. And his head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass. When you look at the letter to the church in Theatira, that description is given to that one. But more specifically, it says it's the Son of God. Who is the only begotten Son of God? Jesus Christ. So we know that he's the one that gave that message to the church in Theotira and is the same person throughout. As if they burned in a furnace, sorry guys, reading on, as if they burned in the furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. This is, the, this is something to describe the, the one that's giving the message to the church in Ephesus again. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. You see that reference in uh, the letter to the church in Pergamos. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. That reference is made to the letter the church in, to the church in Smyrna. So by just comparing scripture with scripture, we see that the person giving the message doesn't specifically say Jesus, but if you look at those references, you can't deny that it is the Lord Jesus Christ that is giving those messages to the seven churches in Asia. All right. Now, I, I did mention earlier, right, uh, so church, you know, we're, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And when we go through tribulation, we can be here for one another. Because no one else in the world is going to understand us. Most of the world is lost if they're not reprobate. But another interesting thing I want you to note as well is because who we have here today and who we do usually see here in church is not only the brethren and brother that we have with us. There's another special brother that we have um, and I'm going to have a look at the, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. So if you want to turn there to Hebrews chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 9, because there's another brother there with us. Hebrews chapter 2, starting in verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2, starting in verse 9. We have another brother. Verse 9 says, but we see Jesus. Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour, that he by the grace of God should taste death for, death for every man, for it became him, who? Jesus, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth, who? Jesus, and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Who? Jesus. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. Jesus is another brother that we have here with us today. Jesus is here with us. I think it's in the midst of two or three. When two or three are gathered together, he says, I am in the midst of thee. Jesus is with us. He is our other brother there and companion in tribulation. All right, so what I've done, guys, is I've looked at the, the, the seven letters to the seven churches in Asia. Now, 
I wanted to pick out um, reoccurring themes, so things that sort of come up more often. And I've got six points that I want to touch on today, okay? Six points I want to touch on today, and I think these are things that, that Jesus kind of stressed in his messages to the, the, the seven churches which are in Asia. All right, so the first point is works. The first point is works. So if you want to turn to Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. And if you're already there and you've already started reading along, you will see within the first words that the Lord um, said, you'll see he mentions the works of the children of God. He says, I know thy works and thy labour and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake has laboured and has not fainted. Jumping down to verse 9 of the same chapter, please. He says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. All right, so he's talking about their works, all right. But the thing I want to say, all right, what works is he concerned about? All right, well, what works did he talk about? Let's go to verse 4 of that same chapter, please. Verse 4. Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, he says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove them. Oh, sorry, will move thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Now, remember, that candlestick is the church. So if we're not doing the first works of Jesus, he can remove the candlestick if he wants to. The first works. All right, so what are these first works? Well, the question I would ask is, what was, the, what was he concerned about before he went back up into heaven with the Father? What was he concerned about there? Um, now, I'm just going to turn there really quickly. Okay, so Mark chapter 16, verse 5, starting at verse 15, he said, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. The gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. In Matthew 28, starting at verse 18. Again, I'm just going to go there really quickly again, guys. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even until the end of the world. Amen. So the first works he is concerned about is us preaching the gospel to the lost. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, someone might want to be nitpicking, the scholar out there or whatever. He said, I thought you said the first works. Aren't they the last things that Jesus said? Okay, well, I'll give that to you. Everyone turn to Matthew chapter 4, if you will, please. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. The first works. Preaching the gospel is the first works. We'll look, have a look at that in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. Going from verse uh, 18 to 19, we're going to be looking at. Verse 19, Matthew chapter 4, sorry, Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, sorry guys. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother. So he's walking along, this is the first time he's seen Simon and Andrew his brother. Casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith, so as soon as he sees them, he says unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So what's the first thing he asks them to do? To be fishers of men. Soul winning. All right. Fishers of men. Soul winning. Before teaching all things, before baptizing. All right. Because someone cannot get baptized until they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, can they? can't they? All right. Myself, I had to get baptized twice because I didn't believe the right gospel. I was taught by the Seventh-day Adventists the wrong gospel. So I had to get baptised again. And you can't get baptised before hearing the gospel and believing unto, on the Lord unto salvation. Proverbs chapter 11 verse 30 says really quickly, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. He that winneth souls is wise. Go, actually, go right back to Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, if you will. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. We're talking about first works here today, brethren. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. 
Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, the Bible reads, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, the first words of God, be fruitful and multiply. First command. And replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. As Christians, how do we be fruitful and multiply? We preach the gospel. We preach the gospel. These are the first works that Christ is concerned about. That's the first point I think he left for his church and he wanted his church to be concerned about. Or his churches, let's say churches, I don't want to get into this universal church idea because there's many churches out there. Amen? Amen. All right. Patience, I believe, is the second thing he kind of stressed when he was speaking to the churches. Patience. So if we can go back to Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. I think we want to go back to that verse a couple of times, guys, but you should know how know it by the time we finish. Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. Not only does our Lord and Savior want us to continue in the first works, he wants us to be patient. He wants us to be patient in this present evil world and with each other. Be patient. He says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 2, he says, I know thy works and thy labour, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, verse 3, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast laboured, and hast not fainted. Be patient, is what the Lord says. Be patient. Be patient in temptations. Be patient in temptations. I want you all to turn to... Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6, if you will, please, guys. 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6. The Lord wants us to be patient. It's so easy to just, you know, you know sometimes in myself, or, or, myself as well, guys, you, you're sitting there some days and just thinking, Jesus, come back. This world is too wicked. But he wants us to be patient. Because he wants us to fill our mansions in heaven. In heaven. First Peter chapter 1, verse 6, the Bible reads, Wherein ye greatly rejoice. I want you to keep that, that, um, that uh, bit of text in your mind because we'll come back to that. This is what's going to help us in our temptations. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being, made, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having, whom having not seen ye love, in whom, though, sorry, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. All right, you know... Not all of us here come from a Christian background. And if we have um, Christianity today is, you know, one Bible verse, a few poems, singing, and, and that's it. A lot of Christians haven't been into their Bible. All right? We haven't had that, that solid foundation of the truth. All right? um, so how do we rise above temptations, the, trialing of our, uh, the trial of our faith? All right. Remember it said there in verse 6 at the start, it says, wherein you greatly rejoice. So we need to find what we greatly rejoice in. So if you go back a little bit, uh, you go back a little bit in that same chapter starting at verse 3, it actually tells us what we can rejoice in, what we should be reflecting upon and what we should, should always remember. Because it's very easy to forget what the Lord has done for us or what the Lord is going to do for us. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you, reserved in heaven for each and every one of you that have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So how do we overcome the temptations of this present evil world? Because you know, the devil's out there. He wants to tempt us with sin, you know, jump into sin. Um, but, but this world is going to pass away. 
heaven and earth are going to be restored. We should rejoice in what's going to be incorruptible. See, this body is corruptible. This body is going to, going to die and go back to the earth. But God's got a body waiting for us in heaven that's incorruptible, that's eternal, that we are going to inherit and have forever. This is what we need to be keeping our mind fixed upon when we, we come across temptations in the world. I'm going to go really quickly to Romans chapter 6, verse 20. It says, For when ye were servants... Of, sorry, for when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye? All right, so I don't, I don't know what your backgrounds were, guys, but my background isn't actually exactly perfect. Um, I've done things I'm not proud of. And, and, you know, what fruit had I from that? What was I going to see from those things in eternity? That's a question to ask. Then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed, are now ashamed. For the end of those things is death. Death, but now being made free from sin, we are free from sin and become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end, everlasting life. Everlasting life. So if we're ever faced with temptations, you know, in this world or going back to old sins, we need to think about, we need to reflect upon what, what, what's waiting for us, that eternal, that eternal body, that eternal inheritance. Be patient also. So the Lord wants to be patient in temptations, but he wants us to be patient in the world. He wants us to be patient in this present evil world. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Be patient, brethren. It's hard. It gets harder when you get older, actually. I used to be a very patient child, but it's, it's getting harder to be patient. But that's why you need to reflect upon the word of God. It really helps. It really does help. So be patient in the world. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak, they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. The, the way we conduct ourselves as Christians in this world has an impact on how the world sees God. So if we're, we're holy, righteous, and, and unblameable, the, Lord, uh, the world looks at the Lord as holy, righteous, and unblameable. But if we're just going to be as the world, they're going to see God as the world. This is the, this concept of, you know, we, you know, they all say we're worshipping the one God. We're not worshipping the one God. Muslims don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Jews don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. It's a different God. It is a different God. But we need to show the world what, what the true God is like, what the true God is is like and it says by as it said there they may by your good works which shall behold sorry they may by your good works which they they shall behold glorify god in the day of visitation who knows by the way you live your life and people see you know we've got to preach the gospel regardless faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of god but if you preach the gospel to someone you know, over and over again and they're not receiving they're not you know calling upon the lord they're not believing who knows with, with, with what that, that preaching that you've, you've done to, with them, they see Jesus in the clouds, you know, the, the Lord might let them call upon him in that last, that last moment, that last instance. We don't know, brethren, but keep preaching the gospel and keep living for the Lord. Um, Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, I'm just going to go there really quickly. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And then in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, really quickly, it says, For our conversation is in heaven. Our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body. This is a vile body, vile body that's going to go back to the earth that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So the Lord wants us to keep the first works, but he wants us to be patient in temptations in the world. He wants us to be patient with our spouse. He wants us to be patient with our spouse. Turn to First Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. I do apologize um, to the wives. I am going to pick on you a little bit, but I will pick on the husbands as well. Don't worry. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 1. 
First Peter chapter 3, verse 1. It says, likewise, keep that, that in your mind as well, because I'm going to show you what Lord expects wives to be like, basically. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may be without the so that they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold and of putting on apparel, but let it be that hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. All right. Likewise, what does he want us to be like? What does he want wives to be like? In regards to their husbands. So you have to actually go back to the, first, the previous chapter. So it's in 1 Peter chapter 2 starting in verse 18. Let's just go back to the, the previous chapter if you will please guys. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 18 because it says likewise. Well likewise like what? Like what? Verse 18 reads. Servants be subject to your masters with all fear. Not only to the good and gentle, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. Well, I looked in the dictionary to see what froward actually meant. Froward means perverse, unyielding, disobedient. Yeah, someone that just wants to do their own thing. Not being obedient to the Lord. Froward. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5 verse 24, please. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24. Be patient with your spouse. Be patient with your spouse. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands only when they're not sinning. Is that what it says? Only when they're keeping God's laws, only when they're going to church. It says, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. In everything. Now, ladies, I don't want to be too tough on you or whatever, but we live in a Christian country. You get to choose your husband, all right? There's no arranged marriages here. So choose wisely. I always say to my girls, Look, while I'm here, God says I'm your boss. When you get married, your husband is your boss, so choose wisely. You don't want to choose an unsaved person. You don't want to choose someone that's... I've got three criteria for my girls, if you want to know. They need to be saved, they need to be soul winners, and they need to have a good work ethic. Okay? So ladies, I would say, and if we're not married yet, marry someone that's like that. And if you found someone that's like that, marry them. Marry them. In everything... Now the, proud, now, the husband might say, you know, I just, now I just want to pick on the husbands now for a second, because they might say, yes, you tell them. You tell them, Brother Anthony. They've got to listen to us. But, but don't be high-minded, husbands. Don't be high-minded. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, doesn't he? He chasteneth. All right, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. If you can go there, please. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. So the Lord's asking, you know, wives, because men are going to fall short. We're not Jesus, guys. We, we can try to be if we stay in his word, but we're, we're going to be forward now and again. But he, he also gives a message here to our husbands. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honour unto the wife as the weaker vessel. And as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now, in the Garden of Eden, it wasn't Adam that was tempted, it was Eve, okay? Now, I never made this up, guys. It's what the Bible says. It says the, the, the wife is the weaker vessel, because the wife has a bigger heart, right? Uh, we, women have a bigger heart. 
and, and they're more, I guess, loving than men in, in that, that kind of sense. But it says here to husbands, you know, give one unto the wife as the weaker vessel, because look there, yeah, it says, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, they're, they're joint heirs with you, if they have believed on the Lord, that your prayers be not hindered. If, if, if husbands aren't giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and being that leader and that guide unto the wife, your prayers can be hindered, is what the Bible says here. Now, you must, still might get that proud husband and might say, oh, look, I don't care. You've already told me that they've got to listen to me regardless. Um, and I'm just going to abuse my power and do what I want to do. Well, there was one foolish person who did abuse his power as a, as a husband um, and, and that authority that God gave him. And I want us to turn back to 1 Samuel chapter 25 to see what happened um, to that man. He had a, he had a holy uh, and righteous and, and godly wife, but he wanted to abuse his power. So that's 1 Samuel chapter 5. 25, and we're going to start in verse 2. So husbands, let us not be high-minded. Just because we're the boss in the house, well, Jesus is the boss of us, isn't he? 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 2. I think Jesus said, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 2, the Bible reads, And there was a man, there was a man, who's this man? In Maon, whose possessions were in Carmel, and, a man, and the man was very great. So he's a very wealthy and prosperous man, he's a rich man. And he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of that man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. But the man was curlish and evil in his doings. And he was of the house of Caleb. So I looked at the definition of curlish. Curlish is like someone that's rude or unfeeling, you know, doesn't care about anyone. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm rich or whatever. I don't care. I'm the boss. Yeah? So this is the, the, the attitude of, of Nabal. Uh, but if you look at his wife there, his wife uh, was of good understanding, beautiful countenance. And she was, she was a godly and holy, holy woman when you, when you read um, now, just a bit of the story. So, you know, he says he's tending his sheep there. So uh, David and his men, I believe, were on the run from Saul. This is at, at the time when Saul was still king, but David had gone with his men and he had a bit of a group there. So David, um, so like Nabal had a, had a group of sheep there. So David, David and his, his you know, soldiers, his mighty men, were, were protecting the shepherds and the sheep. Um, from, you know, outsiders and enemies and that kind of thing. And then, I guess, in doing that, they've pleaded, you know, Nabal, because Nabal's a wealthy man, you know, he's got 3,000 sheep. You could, yeah, no more need be said. But um, so he's, 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 they're protecting the sheep for, for um, Nabal, just doing it out of, out of goodwill. And, and then they've asked, you know, Nabal if he could, you know, uh, spare them some supplies or food and that kind of thing. Um, and, and, the, and, and Nabal gave the message of, now, you've got to think, you know, they, they were singing the song of, you know, Saul's slain his thousands and David his ten thousand. So they know who David is. But I think, you know, with Nabal being a wealthy man, he probably knows that David's in a bit of trouble. He's, he's not in the king's palace anymore. He's in trouble with the king. He's saying, who's David? He, he knew who David was. Who's David and, and this person? And he said, I'm not going to give him this, these things. The message gets back to David and David's like, oh, gee, Yeah. So he's going to go to the kingdom and, and, he's, and he said, I'll slay anyone that pisseth against the wall. So, you know, without getting too graphic, he's talking about the men. Um, and so he's going to kill them. Now, th now, Abigail, Nabal's wife, gets word of this and just in her wisdom, she, she, she packs the bread and everything and she, she goes before David. Nabal's still doing whatever he wants to do. He's, he's actually getting uh, a feast or whatever ready. So she comes before David, she bows before him and, you know, uh, you know please be gracious unto my, my, my husband. Uh, Lord King, um, and gives him the food. And, um, and then David, uh, he, his wrath was turned away because of the wisdom of the wife. And, and I just think um, there's probably plenty of times that my wife's probably got me out of trouble and we need to be, be thankful for that, guys. Because um, if we just, yeah, if we just uh, was allowed to do whatever we wanted to do, we'd, we'd probably fall into yeah, some, some, some ditches out there. So Abigail's gone to David. She's given him the food and, and David has, has turned away his wrath. <clears throat> You know, she's come back to the kingdom. Um, Nabal, you know, he's partying up or whatever. He's got his, you know, 3,000 sheep. He probably killed a couple of them to, to um, feed the people. Um, and then, you know, he's, he's drunk with wine. And he wakes up in the morning and, and Abigail, um, or he gets word of, of, I think Abigail told him, I can't remember. 
But he gets word of what David was going to do, and he just, I think he has a heart attack. He, his heart went to stone, all right? His heart went to stone. And then 10 days later, so if we're still there in 1 Samuel chapter 25, go down to verse 38. Verse 38. So this is, this is I would say, a warning to the proud husband that knows his rights, but not his responsibilities. So 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 38. And it came to pass about 10 days after, so this is after his heart fell to stone and he, he was, um, I guess, paralysed. Listen to this. That the Lord smote Nabal. That the Lord smote Nabal, that he died. That he died. So because Nabal was a wicked husband, the Lord smote him. And when you read on, Abigail ends up, well, not only did you know, the Lord smite him, well, then his, his, his wife ended up with King David. So, so, you know, husbands, um, give honour unto your wives as a weaker vessel, that your prayers be not hindered, and that the Lord don't smite you, I would say. Be wise. Be wise. Patience. Again, guys, this is patience. I just talked about the patience of, of each other with our spouses, all right? Of our spouses, because we all sin and come short of the glory of God. But also patience with the elder. Patience. With the elder or the pastor, it talks here. So in First Peter chapter five, First Peter chapter five, starting in verse five, First Peter chapter five, verse five, it's just talking about. So the reason I'm going through all these things, guys, is that these um, teachings or these learnings were were what Jesus was telling the seven churches in his last messages to the churches, and these are things that we should consider. As, as Christians and, and children of God in the church. So be patient with the pastor. First Peter chapter 5, verse 5 says, Likewise, ye younger men, submit yourselves unto the older. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Very quickly, I'm just going to go to Proverbs 29, verse 23. It says, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honour shall uphold the humble in spirit. Now, we see another example in, in the Bible, in the Word of God, where you know, members of the church weren't being very patient or, or honouring the, the office of the, of the bishop. And we're going to do that. We're going to go look at that back in Numbers chapter 16, starting in verse 1. Numbers chapter 16, starting in verse 1. Be patient in temptations. Be patient with this present evil world. Be patient with one another. Be patient with your spouse. But be patient with the elder, the man of God. Numbers chapter 16, verse 1, it says, Now Korah... The son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses. Now Moses is, is I guess, a picture. He was, he was basically a shepherd because the congregation, remember, uh, going back to Exodus, is when they were... You know, the, the Passover lamb, the door, blood on the doorpost. So Moses was kind of like, in, in a sense, a pastor. All right, but the, these three wicked men, they, they rose up before Moses with the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. So now they're raising up against, they, they rose up before Moses, they're going against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, You take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, we're all saved. We're all saved. Why can't we do things the way we're suggesting as well? Is what they're saying. Every one of them, and the Lord is among. Sorry, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord? See, really, I think these three men wanted the power themselves. Because usually, you know, when somebody accuses you of, of um, a sin or, or something that uh, I don't know, someone just falsely accuses you flat out. You think about it. You, now, is this their sin? Because usually it is, and I believe that's what their sin was. They wanted the power. Moses and Aaron are just following what the Lord's wishes were. The Lord spoke to them and they gave, they gave commandment and they did things in order as the Lord had them do. But they want the power. You know, God has appointed Moses and Aaron to rule over and guide. God has appointed Pastor Kevin to rule over and guide over us. Same principle. 
Korah and his cronies, just because they wanted the power, accused Moses and Aaron of wanting the power. So Numbers, jumping down to Numbers 16, 28. Number 16, verse 28. Numbers chapter 16, verse 28. So we've already seen what um, the Lord did to the proud husband. Let's see what the Lord did to the proud um, churchgoer, if you will. For, uh, Numbers chapter 16, verse 28. It says, And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, you know, so I guess basically they die of old age or you know, whatever the common death was back then. If these men die the common death of all men, is what Moses is saying, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up and all uh, with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then you shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass as soon as he made an end of speaking, so as soon as Moses finished saying those things, all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their gods, uh, all their goods, sorry. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them. For they said, Lest the earth swallow us up. So they're seeing this, gee, I'm getting away from this guy. Getting away from this guy. And I think there's probably that principle. I just thought, just thought of it then, guys. You know when someone's been kicked out of the church and it says we're not meant to have fellowship with them? I, th I think, I, I, they just come to mind then. You know, just, they need to reconcile themselves with the leader or they need to get themselves right with God. All right. So we're not, we, I guess the point I'm making here, you know, we're pretty lucky. We've got a pretty good pastor. He's, he's sounding a lot of things and he's, he's a good leader, I would say. Uh, but look, we, we might not agree with everything our pastor does. But if it's not a sin, be careful that we don't sin. Have a think about that. Be careful that we don't sin if what he's doing is not a sin. James chapter 5 verse 7. James chapter 5 verse 7. It says, Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Remember, let's rejoice in those eternal bodies, that, that eternal life. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another. Brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Jump down to verse 11, if you will, please. Be ye also patient. Uh, verse 11, it says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. We've heard of the patience of Job, but I just want us to remind ourselves of the patience of Job. So if we can turn to Job 42, starting at verse 12. Job 42, starting at verse 12. Job chapter 42, starting at verse 12. Job chapter 42, starting at verse 12, it says... So the Lord, so we know the story of Job. He was a wealthy man, righteous man. Um, and then Satan, um, you know, says to for the Lord, the only reason why he's, he's not cursing you or whatever is because he's wealthy. Let me, let, me, let me tempt him. Let me do all these things. Um, and, you know, he lost, all his, he lost all his children. He lost all his riches. Um, and he was just, yeah. But, you know, one beautiful thing about the story of Job is that although the devil was able to, you know, put sores on his skin and kill all these kids, the devil couldn't take away his life. And that's a picture of salvation. Once you've believed on the Lord and you have light, new life in the Lord, the devil cannot take away your life. He's just going to try and make your life a bit harder, but he can't take that life away. It's eternal. So let's see the latter end of Job. So remember, he was wealthy, he was righteous. So the Lord, so this is starting in verse 12, sorry, brethren. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels 
and a thousand yoke of oxen and a thousand asses. He had also seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first Jemima, and the name of the second Keziah, in the name of the third Keren Hapuk. And in all the land were no women found so fair as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brethren. After this lived Job an hundred and forty years, a hundred and forty years, and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. So Job died being old and full of days. And I, I didn't actually get the time to go back and compare how much riches he had in comparison to before, but I think it says there he had more in the latter, latter end. So consider the patience of Job. You know, if we're long-suffering in, in living holy, godly and righteous lives in this present evil world, we're going to have more riches in heaven. We're going to have more riches in heaven if that's the case. Okay. All right. So the third point I got out of, you know, Jesus' messages to the churches and, and a lot of, um, I think a lot of Baptist churches uh, are very ignorant of this fact because a lot of false doctrine has crept in, um, is the fact that he warned us about tribulation. He warned us about tribulation. Not only does he want us to do the first works, but does he want us to be patient with each other and, and in this world. He warned us about the tribulation. He warned us about the tribulation, that we be not offended. Turn to Revelation chapter 2 verse 9. Revelation chapter 2 verse 9. Revelation chapter 2, verse 9. <clears throat> the Bible reads, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them, blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but that are synagogue of Satan. Verse 10 says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Um, I, I believe in Revelation, there's pretty, it shows us that there's pretty much four ways in which the devil persecutes us in these last days. I believe I've found there. Um, so if we can turn to Revelation chapter 6, starting in verse 1. So I believe there's pretty much four ways, four key go-to ways that the devil comes to us and tries to make life harder. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. The first way is lies and deceit. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. And while he went forth, uh, sorry, and he went forth, conquering and to conquer. I'm just going to turn there very quickly back to Matthew 24 to verse 4. It says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For there shall come in my name, for, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Now, just looking back at Revelation chapter 6 there, verse 1, it says he comes on a white horse. Now, if you've looked at the book of Revelation, later in the book of Revelation, Jesus comes on a white horse. Okay? Jesus comes on a white horse. But this white horse earlier in the book of Revelation is actually talking, I believe, about the Antichrist. Because he has a bow and he's conquering and, and he's going to be con uh, to conquer. Now, one interesting thing about the bow, I talked to Brother Luke about it, and it might have been a couple other brethren as well, is that a bow is a weapon of war, right? But the interesting thing about a bow is that you don't have to be in the, in the midst and the heat of the battle. You can just stand off and shoot your arrows, can't you? But you notice that bow doesn't have any arrows. That bow doesn't have any arrows. So the Antichrist doesn't have any arrows. You know who I think the Antichrist is going to use if we're not careful? It's our children. Because remember our, our children are likened unto arrows? So we need to preach them the gospel. We need to get them saved. We need to bring them up in nurture and admonition of the Lord. Or the devil will use our children against us. The Antichrist will use our children against us through lies and deceit. Another thing is, uh, another theory I have about that as well is that, um, well, television, you know, kind of shoots out all these um, lies and misinformation, right? But the people that, that are, that are, that are um, organising all these lies and misinformation, they're not actually in their living room with you, are they? If you have a television, they're just sending it all out like a bow, like a bow. So, tribulation. The devil, I think he's going to, he tries to attack his church and, his ch and, and God's church. The devil tries to attack God's children 
and the churches of God through lies, but also through wars. In that same uh, Revelation chapter 6, go to verse 3. Through wars and rumours of wars, fear. Revelation chapter 6, verse 3. It says, And when he had opened this hope, sorry, when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Just going to turn there really quickly. Matthew 24, verse 6 says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. You know, isn't the devil always trying to stir um, wars and dissension among us? Um, if it's not trying to get the world to put a tax on Christianity, it's trying to get Christians to fight other Christians about petty things. Wars. It's going to try and get us through lies and wars and rumours of wars. Another thing I believe is through, is through economics, through our wealth. Tribulation. Revelation chapter 6 verse 5. If we can go there please, brethren. Revelation chapter 6 verse 5. Revelation chapter 6 verse 5 it says, And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And behold, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Now when you look at, um, you know, you compare scripture with scripture and the use of the word penny, a penny is a day's wages. So a measure of wheat for a day's wages and three measures of barley for a day's wages. They're in, a, they're in uh, poverty there. They're in an economic downturn or whatever you want to call it. I see there. Matthew 24 verse 7 really quickly says, For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. All these things are the beginnings of sorrows. You know, one thing they did back in, I think, as the 1970s is, is Australia, um, you know, and it's, you don't know what they were thinking. Um, that there, was a, there was this thing called the, the sign called the Lima Declaration, right? And what this did is Australia had to make a promise to, to import X amount of goods from, from third world countries. Like, it sounds nice and, and well in, it, it's kind of forcing charity, if you ask me. It's forcing charity. You cannot force charity. All right? So what it did is... Um, it, it, it really puts a strain and stress on, on Australian produce and Australian products. Because when you look at it in Australia, we have enough riches and wealth to be an independent country. Yeah. An independent country, an independent nation, we have, we have everything we need. We're, we're the lucky country. But is this what the devil wants? Does the devil want a little country down here doing its own thing? Nah. So you have, you have these things through the United Nations, like Lima Declaration had to sign on and, and promise to a certain amount of imports. And I think, I think it was in 1975 that, that this, this declaration was signed. And if you look at from that time up until now, so many Australian businesses went out, out, of, out, of, they went out of business. A lot of farmers suffered. Because why... Well, just think of us as consumers, right? If you're going to the shop, let's say the Australian... A uh, kilo of Australian apples is, say, you know... This is just an example, this is not accurate facts, but if, if it's, just say, it's $10 because, it, you know, you need to, you know, cover the workload and all that kind of stuff. But if, if, if it's a $10 for, an, for a kilo of Australian apples and you get a kilo of, uh, say, apples from, um, you know, China for, for $5, we as consumers, which one are we going to buy? We're going to buy the $5 kilo apples. And this is, this is just the principle of what, what's happened since the signing of this declaration. Um, so they don't want Australia to be independent. And this is why I say uh, economics and, and, and un unnecessary regulations on, on you know, business and that kind of stuff in the country is a way the devil persecutes. You know, ultimately, because he, he's not going to get Christians, because, you know, there's still businesses out there that fight on um, and, and um, going strong. But ultimately, he's going to introduce a cashless society. We read about this mark of the beast, and we as Christians can't take the mark of the beast. So that's going to be... I don't think it's going to be long until the Lord comes after they try and do those, pull that kind of stunt. All right. So, yeah, and when the devil can't conquer us through lies, wars, and economics, he persecutes us through, through our health. Through our health. And you see uh, back in the time when the Catholic Church was in power, 
Um, a lot of Christians were killed just before their profession of faith. That they didn't want to. They they denounced. They they didn't accept the Pope. They accept the Bible as the authority of the church. Revelation chapter six verse seven. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the fourth beast say, "Come and see." And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Matthew 24 verse 9 says, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. That's Jesus talking. So you look at the strategies. They try to do it by force through wars and the, and the, and the sword. You know, we don't have guns to protect ourselves physically. You know, hunger by famine. Believers can't take the mark of the beast and the beasts of the earth. Now, when you look at diseases under a microscope, they look like little beasts, like little animals, right? So the diseases through the earth. All right. So, so what's stopping a wicked person from getting in charge, right? And deciding that he's going to put, uh, you know, a wicked, I don't even want to say, but like a, a disease in, in, in vaccines and things like that, all right? Because a lot of us, you know, we, we take these things, we, we have faith in the government that the government's going to protect us, but what's stopping a wicked person from putting diseases and illnesses in those type of things? Um, now, look, I'm not saying all vaccines are, are evil. What I will say, though, is that we only really gave one of our kids um, the hep B shot and, and only one of our kids really got um, jaundice at new, uh, when they were a newborn baby. So I don't know, this is just a, a, an observation that I've made. Now you might say, gee, pretty full on, Anthony, talking about all this stuff. Wow. But this is why church is important, because our brothers and companions in tribulation are here. And the brother and companion in tribulation, which is Jesus Christ. Now with this said, I just want to turn to Revelation chapter 13, verse 9 really quickly, because this is something that will encourage us as Christians. Because they're not going to get away with it. You know, if they're not going to hell, they're going to suffer. These people that do wicked things against God's children. Revelation chapter 13 verse 9 gives us a bit of a glimpse of what's going to happen to them. Revelation chapter 13 verse 9. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Those that lead us into captivity are going to go into captivity, likely hell because they're probably reprobate if they're openly uh, persecuting God's children. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Remember the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Who's the Word of God? Jesus. You know what's really funny? Is that all these people that choose not to believe on the finished work of Jesus Christ think they're going to be ruling and reigning in hell. But it says that they're going to be tormented by the presence of the Lamb. Who's the Lamb of God? Jesus will be tormenting them in hell while we'll be seeing the, the, the life of Jesus up in heaven. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. So he warned us about tribulation, guys. There's no getting around it. He warned us, you know, and if we don't suffer these things in our lifetime, our children may. So we need to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We need to be going out there and giving people the gospel. Because I believe, the way I see it, is that the reason why God allows the devil to, to send tribulation upon us is because not a lot of Christians are doing the work of God these days, are they? Not a lot of people are getting out there and preaching the gospel and, 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 and seeing the lost saved. Because if we can save those people out there that are lost, who knows that might be the next Prime Minister of Australia? Who knows that might be the, the next person to lead a movement or to, to, to force a movement in Australia to give the gospel and turn it into one of those nations which are saved? You know, who knows? Who knows? But he also warned us, this is another thing that the Baptists are a little bit mixed up on as well, I guess mainstream Baptists, is he also warned us about the Jews. He also warned us about the Jews. Because when you look 
through the Bible, especially in the book of Acts, you know, the question is, where is the persecution and tribulation coming from on Christians? Where is it coming from? John 16, verse 2, really quickly, I'm just going to go there. It says, They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. There's a bit of a hint there. Synagogues. Who worships in synagogues? Go to Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, if you will, brethren. We might already be there. Revelation chapter 2, verse 9. Revelation chapter 2, verse 9. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, say they are Jews, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Turn to 1 John chapter 2, if you will, please. 1 John chapter 2, verse 22. Now, if the word synagogue and those that say they are Jews isn't enough to give it away, let's go here. 1 John Chapter 2, verse 22. Where's the persecution and tribulation coming from? Coming from? Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? Christ is another word for Messiah. Who denies that Jesus is the Messiah? I'll read it again. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist. Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. They don't worship the Father because they don't have the Son. They don't have the Messiah. Matthew chapter 27, verse 24. I'm just going to go there really quickly. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. He's talking about Jesus. See ye to it. Then answered all the people, this is the Jews, and said, His blood be on us and on our children. His blood be on us and on our children. They hated Jesus Christ. They hated the Lord. In Acts, I'm just going to make reference really quickly. In Acts chapter 1 verse 18, the Jews commanded them not to speak in Jesus' name. Not to speak in Jesus' name. It's kind of funny, hey, because when you, you're in the workplaces, I don't know if it's the case in all workplaces, but you know you're not really allowed to talk about your religion or you know, your faith and that kind of stuff. wonder where that come from. Well, in Acts verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 18, it says the Jews commanded them not to speak in Jesus' name. In Acts 7, chapter 7, verse 57 to 58, the Jews stoned Stephen for telling the truth. Now you look at what Stephen said to them and you can compare scripture with scripture. He basically told them what happened and they stoned him. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to accept Jesus. In Acts chapter, in Acts chapter 9 verse 22 to 23, Jews sought to kill Saul because he proved Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God from the scriptures. They wanted to, they wanted to kill him just because he was showing their Messiah in their own word. In Acts chapter 13, verse 44 to 45, Jews envied because all heard God's word. They didn't want us Gentiles to hear God's word. They envied. They envied. But God is for all. It's the same Lord over all men. How much more proof do you need? If they believed in God, they'd become Christians. Amen? If they believed in God, they'd become Christians. They're not even real Jews, I would say. Because Romans chapter 2, verse 28, 29, it says, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Amen. Of God. Now, someone might say, well, that's New Testament. That's not for the Jews. The Jews run on the Old Testament. Okay, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 14. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 14. He warned us that there would be tribulation. He also warned us about the Jews. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 14, the Bible reads, Behold the heaven of heaven, sorry, behold the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God. The earth also, with all that is therein. Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, 
even you above all people, as it is this day. He didn't choose the Jews because they were special people. He chose them because they were, they were slaves and they were the lowest of the earth. He wanted to glorify his name in a people that, that, were, that were slaves, really. Next verse, this is what it says. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart. Your heart and be no more stiff-necked. The Jews need the gospel just as much as the Gentiles. The Jews need the gospel just as much as the Gentiles. Now, but let us not forget they can be saved if they believe. They need to believe Jesus is the Son of God. They need to believe Jesus is the Messiah. Because remember in Matthew 27 verse 25 it says, Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. The blood's on them, but you can't be saved without the faith. Amen? Amen. Romans chapter 11, verse 23. I'm just going to go there really quickly. And they also, talking about the Jews. So like if we, get on, if we knock on the door, guys, and it's a Jew, don't just turn around. It's, they're probably not, a, like not all Jews are reprobate, right? Because it says here in Romans 11, chapter 23, they need the gospel just as much as we did. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in because for God... He's able to graft them in again. You know, but you know, you see, like I said, we knock on the door of a Jew, try and think of those scriptures that, that prove he's the Messiah and show that to them. Give them the gospel. But you know, as, as with Jews, as with all people, not, not everyone's going to accept that, that free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Um, and if they choose to side, side with Satan and make our lives harder, the uh, Bible says they'll bow down and worship us. It says, they'll bow down and worship us. Go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. So he warned us about tribulation. He warned us about those who say they are Jews and are not but are the synagogue of Satan. These things, if they don't come in our lifetime, they could come in our children's lifetime. We need to prepare them. We need to get them ready. We, need, we basically need to go out and preach the gospel. So I believe... Um, the more we're doing God's work, the more he will protect us. The more we're doing his work, the more he'll protect us from the present evil world. Revelation chapter 3 verse 9. But like I said, um, if we give the gospel to a Jew and they reject it, you know, wipe the dust off your feet, walk away, and they choose to side with Satan, um, they're going to bow down before us. Revelation chapter 3 verse 9 says, Behold, I will make them. Remember, who is giving the, letter, uh, the message to the churches? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. That's what our Lord says to us. Those that choose the synagogue of Satan to persecute us, they will bow down before us. We will rule them with a rod of iron. Okay. So in the, the seven letters, I, I found that there was an emphasis on the works, more specifically the first works that God, God wanted us to do, preach the gospel to the lost. He wanted us to be patient with each other. All right? We're all going to fall short. We're all going to fall short, but let's be patient with one another in, 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 in this present evil world. He warned us about tribulation. He warned us about the, the, those that say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. But he also reminded us, of his promise. So the fifth point is overcometh. Overcometh. Listen to the promises to those who overcometh. Um, I'm just going to go there really quickly. You don't have to follow me, guys. I'm going to go through very, very quickly. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, it says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. You know that tree of life that Adam and Eve couldn't eat of because they'd live forever? Those that overcometh will eat of that tree of life. Revelation chapter 2, verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Shall not be hurt of the second death. That was a blessing for me because being in the Adventist church, they, they push this mark of the beast stuff. Um, and they, they've got it all wrong. They think it's Sunday worship. Um, but, you know, Paul worshipped on a Sunday. I think, I can't remember, I think it's in Acts chapter 21. But they push this mark of the beast stuff. But one thing you, you know that's interesting about the mark of the beast says, they shall be heard of the second death. But those that overcome us shall not be heard of the second death. And if we, we don't remember, I always rave on about this, guys. I'm sorry if I sound like an old man. But um, I'll go back over who is overcometh. It's, it's basically us, right? 
Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Got really no idea what that means, but it sounds pretty cool. Amen. Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Who is he that overcometh the world? Turn to 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. 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 Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, or Messiah, is born of God. Jump down to verse 4. Whatsoever, for, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? We are of them that overcometh the world. We are of them that overcometh the world. We've believed he is the Son we believe that Jesus is the Christ. We shall not be hurt of the second death. I thank you very much for your patience there, brethren. Point two there, patience. Uh, the last point, number six, and keepeth my works. Right, so I deliberately went, left out one of the promises because it deals more with, more with, uh, it deals with more than just salvation. So you notice there, if you're following along, there were six um, references to him that overcometh. But there was one there that, that dealt with a little bit more than salvation. And I left it out. So if you want to turn to Revelation chapter 2, verse 24, if you will, please, brethren. Revelation chapter 2, verse 24. Revelation chapter 2, verse 24, the Bible reads, But I say, but unto you I say, and unto the rest in Theotira, as many as have not this doctrine and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, none other burden, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. Hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, and keepeth my works unto the end. So how do you overcometh? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And keepeth my works unto the end. To him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule, rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father, and I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. If we have saved believers, go out there and preach the gospel. Go out there and do the works of God. Keepeth his works until the end. It says we shall rule. See, I don't think all of us are going to rule. And if we do rule, those that don't do much for the Lord aren't going to be given much, right? But if we're doing the works of God, if we're doing it, we're, you know, we're being a blessing in the church. We're, 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 um, even if we're being that silent partner out soul winning and we see someone one to the Lord by the brother that we, or sister that we um, uh, support, we're going to give, be given more right to rule. And, and we're not going to rule with you know, like, you know, the world, like unfair rules and policy and all that kind of stuff. It says we're going to rule with a rod of iron. <laughs> A rod of iron. Use your imagination. All right. Now, if that doesn't motivate you to want to go out there and preach the gospel, do the works of God, I want you to think of the lost. You know, your neighbours, your colleagues, your friends, your family. You know, I, I can't say that all my family are saved at the moment. Um, but if you're going out there and you're preaching the gospel, you're getting better at, at, at giving the gospel to people. It's going to, be, it's going to come more natural when you're giving it to your parents or your, or your family or your, your children. All right? Um, I don't know about you, but I want to see all my family in heaven. All my family in heaven. All right? Because, you know, if they don't have Jesus, they don't have life. Can't be forgiven by God if you don't have the Son of God. Cleanse you from all unrighteousness. All right, and there are going to be some tough heads, uh, tough fights ahead of us, guys. But this is why church is important. 
because each and every one of us are brethren and companions in tribulation. But if you remember at the start there, who else was our brother and companion in tribulation? That's pretty powerful. Pretty powerful. All right. And, and church is important because um, we can encourage each other you know, to, to get out there and, and do the works of God. It's really hard doing it out there by yourself. You know, sometimes, you know, there's been times you can go out there, you can go and knock the door, soul in them by yourself. Um, we've all been there, but, you know, sometimes it gets a bit hard. And, but if we, we're with each other and we, we, we're strengthening each other in the Word of God and we're just seeing everyone go out there and knock those doors, it, it, it becomes easier, you know. It's easy to, to push ourselves. Um, now, I've touched on a bit of everything, guys. I, I do thank you for your patience. But I want to just go to Revelation chapter 21 uh, to finish up the sermon today because it, it's, it's what we have to look forward to as children of God. It's what we've got to look forward to. It's, 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 um, yeah, it's, it's such an encouragement. Revelation chapter 21. So remember, um, just going over the points again really quickly. Uh, Jesus is concerned about our works, more specifically the first works. He, um, he, he um, acknowledged the patience that the brethren showed um, for one another. The patience they showed for one another. He did warn us we would go through tribulation. He warned us about those that say they are Jews. Doesn't mean they're Jews, remember? They need to be circumcised in the heart by believing on the Lord. Um, he reminded us that if we've overcome us, we won't be heard of the second death. We'll eat of the tree of life. We'll be given a new name. So if you don't like your name, Jesus is going to give you a new one, I think that says there. And, and all those promises of he that overcometh. And he said that if we, 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 we overcome us and we keep his works until the end, we're going to rule with a rod of iron. Revelation 21 says, So if you know you're thinking about this world that we're living in now and it, it's, it's getting you down, all this wickedness and sin, and temptations. Have a look at this. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. You know, uh, to the married men out there, remember how beautiful your wife looked when she was adorned for you and she walked down the aisle? That's what the city of Jerusalem is going to look like. When it comes down from heaven. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. God himself is going to be with us. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Remember, we shall not be hurt by the second death. We've overcometh. That doesn't mean everyone we know and love will overcome that though, so we need to preach them the gospel. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying, Come hither. I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even, unto a, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he talked with me, and he that talked with me 
had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs, the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof, 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper. The second foundation, sorry, the second, sapphire. The third, a chalcedony. The fourth, an emerald. The fifth, sardonyx. The sixth, sardius. The seventh, chrysolite. The eighth, beryl. The ninth, a topaz. topaz the tenth, a chrysoprasus. The eleventh, a jacinth. The twelfth, an amethyst, amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. I want to see Jesus. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved. The nations of them which are saved. Do you want Australia to be one of those nations? Let's preach the gospel. The nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth did bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. I'm just going to go there really quickly. Hebrews 12 verse 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we are, wherefore, all, wherefore we also are compassed about... With so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher, and finisher of our faith. Let us pray.